it is the um, worst morning of your life. The reality of yesterday's foreclosure notice is setting in. You don't want to get out of bed, but you get up for coffee. And as you sit there sipping your strongest brew possible, you start to contemplate your life as a homeless person. When suddenly the phone rings and the caller identifies himself as a representative of the IRS. <laughs> oh, great, you think. What else could possibly go wrong? Mr. Carlson, he says, in his emotionless, matter-of-fact, government voice, your tax return for last year came up for a random audit. You start fumbling for your asthma inhaler. <laughs> and as we were reviewing it, we noticed that on line 24 of form 1040, a couple of the numbers were transposed. So we did a complete recalculation of your taxes for last year, and it appears that you overpaid $60,000. <laughs> We sent a refund check by overnight FedEx, and you should have it by 10 this morning. And let us know if you have any questions, or if we can be of any further assistance to you. You know the IRS is here to serve you. By the way, my personal cell phone number is, and just as he was about to get it, then the doorbell rings and you spring up, uh, hoping to see someone in a purplish blue uniform. But it's not FedEx. Instead, it's Ed McMahon. And with cameras rolling, and a giant publisher's clearinghouse check for $10 million. And the amazing thing is that you had not even entered the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes at all this year. As the crew is leaving, a FedEx truck stops in front of your house and a nice young woman brings a check from the IRS to your door. You are in total shock and you are unable to function so you flip on the television set and right there on the news they have lottery numbers from last night and they look exactly like the numbers on your ticket the ticket that you found when you were out collecting aluminum cans and you have just won 45 million dollars after taxes it all sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? And you're really helping me. Amen. <laughs> Is it a dream? Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe you know, not. A dream that far. Yeah, that'd be somebody's biggest fantasy, not a dream. <laughs> Psalm 26 recalls such a, an unbelievable situation. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. If you note on the message guide, I've divided Psalm 126, which is one of the suggested lectionary texts for today, into three sections. And I've labeled the first one, Recalling the Joy of One of God's Great Surprises. Recalling the Joy of One of God's Great Surprises. We do not really know the original context of this psalm or song. Perhaps it had to do with the time of exile, when the people returned to Jerusalem, which is a good thing. You know, when you get your Old Testament, you'll be able to, to read this. When the people returned to Jerusalem, or, or perhaps, and I think more likely, it is one of the times that the Assyrian army had laid siege on Jerusalem, and just at the darkest hour, just when it appeared that the city was about to fall, everyone woke up in the morning and they rubbed the sleep from their eyes and they looked out the window and they saw that the huge army which had camped outside of the city, they had been parked outside of the city for months, three months, they had mysteriously withdrawn. During the night, they, they all packed up and they went home. The city was saved. It was a dream come true. One minute, 
the, the Israelites were cattle in a slaughter yard. Essentially dead meat. The next, they were on top of the world with joy. It was surreal. It was dreamlike. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. Uh, I, I'm, and I'll tell you this just so that you don't think negatively of me, but I'm not really into beauty pageants. But I remember one from uh, 2005 in particular because it was so unusual. Everyone was totally taken for surprise when Miss Iceland was crowned Miss World. She was a total long shot, and it threw everyone in Las Vegas off. Something no one expected, especially Miss Iceland. She didn't expect it. She was just going along for the ride to represent her country. She didn't have much hope of ever even being considered to be a finalist. That was on Saturday morning. But 12 hours later, she was this world, and she was on top of the world. Have you ever been at the bottom? Have you ever been at the bottom and then experienced this great surprise of the Lord's intervention? Now, I haven't had that many bottom-out experiences in my life. Um, many of you are way ahead of me on that one. But, but there have been times times when least expected that, that the Lord has surprised me with His provision. That there was a point uh, financially when I was convinced that, the, that we would never be able to own a home. Uh, I, I was resolved to that. That was okay. I, I, I'd come to accept that. That was no problem. And, and, and then we ended up in a place where homes were affordable. And I, I can remember this sense of surprise when we moved to Texas to start a church there. Now, we lived in Washington State before that, and in Washington, uh, we, we had lived in this small parsonage for five years with three small children, and, and, and then suddenly, in Texas, it, it, it dawned on us in our new situation that, that it would actually kind of work to buy a house. And now, I didn't figure this out. Cheryl figured it out. She, she's, she's always the numbers person in our family. She's, she, she's the one that's got the business mind. There have been times when, when I've been totally lost in terms of figuring out what to do, uh, to do next. What, you know, this job or that job and no job offers, nothing coming. There, there was a, and then, you know, after not having any offers, there was a period of just a couple of days when there were three great options all at once. What's with that? It was like I had I'd wandered through the desert for years so I could get to the place where God was going uh, in order that He might be able to pour it all out on me at once. Just so that I'd recognize where it was coming from. It was like a dream. I think of St. Patrick. You know, today's St. Patrick's Day. You, you remember he was, uh, he was a, a, a young boy in Great Britain. He was kidnapped by pirates, by raiders coming from Ireland who had come and they, they swept through and they grabbed him up and they, they took him off to Ireland to be a slave. And he was a slave on that island for years. And he dreamed of, of coming back, going home to Great Britain, going back to England where, where he might be reunited with his family. That was his dream. And then one day he had a vision from God telling him to walk away from his his situation, the hike across Ireland, and, and to jump on a boat, and he did, and, and he got back to England. Well, you know, the rest of the story, he, you know, God continued to speak with him, and, and he, he, he trained, and, and God said, now I want you to go back to Ireland. <laughs> and, and back to Ireland? He went back to Ireland, where there were no Christians. And he, he conquered Ireland for Christ without an army by, by telling the good news of Jesus. It was like a dream. It was like a dream that any of this could possibly happen. It was just so out of the box. And the psalmist is recalling just such a time, times when quite surprisingly God 
had opened his floodgates and poured out his favor on his people, and, and in doing so, he restored them. When they went from the depths of despair to the heights of this kind of dreamlike joy, in order that they might do something else uh, as a part of this purpose. It, it, except that it, it wasn't, as the psalmist was experiencing it, it wasn't a dream, it was real. Even the pagan neighbors, they recognized what had happened. If you look at verse 2, it was even said at that time among the nations, in essence the, the Gentiles, the heathens, that's what it means by the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And in, and in verse 3, the psalmist sums it all up. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. We are overjoyed. Think about that word, overjoyed. It's kind of like you're overdosing on joy. <laughs> you're overjoyed. You know, you, you know of overdrive, and you know of overeating. You know of overwhelming, you know of overthinking a problem. Some of us do that. You know of overwork, but this is overjoyed. We are overjoyed by this. Now, now typically during the season of Lent, uh, the focus isn't really on joy. But we've seen a lot of, of joy in the biblical passages this Lent. Maybe we've been misreading the whole journey to the cross as being overly somber. I mean, the cross itself is not a pretty sight, yet... Uh, we are big picture people when we talk about the sacrifice and the resurrection. So the psalm, with the psalmist, we sing, Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. What God has done has become the talk of the world. Right? The Lord has done great things for them. And now we add, for us, for we have become the them. It, it, it's a, it's a dreamlike with this unexpected twist in the story, a great surprise ending to the, to the, to the march on Calvary. A, a gift that's, that's better than winning the publisher's clearinghouse prize and having all of our taxes for life returned. The, the surprise gift from the Lord is the greatest cause for joy in the history and in the future of the world. For God didn't just come as a baby to save the world, to grow up so that he could offer himself as this great sacrifice for humanity, paying the price for the sins of the world, releasing the world from bondage to sin. Yes, he did. He came for all of that. He also came to rise from the dead, stomping down death. And, and, if that were not enough, he's coming again as well. God is full of these delightful surprises, overwhelming joy. In, in the second section of the psalm, the psalmist recognizes this pattern of God, or in God. He, uh, he is praying for a repeat. He is praying for a repeat. That's number two, if you're using the message guide. He is praying for a repeat. Lord, change our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in the desert waste, or, or more literally, like dry streams in the Negev. The Negev, like Phoenix, is bone dry in the summer months. And, and, and you know how it is after you've gone through this all this dry period, and, and, and when that first rain comes, and, and you get the smell of the rain in the desert, you're, it picks it up and it, you get that wonderful smell and then it starts to rain and, and the streams and the rivers come to life. <laughs> the psalmist is praying, turn the water on again, Lord. Just like you did in the past when, when, when you exceeded all of the expectations, you, you restored all of our fortunes. Now, I, I really appreciate the message's uh, version's rendering here in verse 4. And now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives. Do it again. Bring rain to our drought-stricken lives. This is a prayer for restoration. It's a prayer for revival. 
and, and, and I think the psalmist is anticipating the coming restorative sacrifice of the Messiah. The psalmist is anticipating Calvary. Lord, we're not, we're not satisfied with the wonderful things you've done in the past, because that's the past. We love them, but and, and, and they were dreamlike, but we want to see your hand at work again. We, we want to see you do it again. We, we need to see your hand at work again. It, it, it seems like it's time to see your hand at work again. Fill the streams of our lives again. Restore us again. Make us whole again. We want to be your righteous people. That would be the greatest joy. Pour out your joy on us again. Then I, I've labeled the third section of the psalm, Dreaming of Future Joy. Dreaming of Future Joy. Verse 5. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those... And I'm thinking of your singing. I'm glad you came to illustrate this verse. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Amen. And dancing. <laughs> Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. Uh, the, the picture is that of this impoverished farmer who has gone through this long period of drought, a long period of scarcity, and yet he's managed to set aside, he's frugal, he's, he's managed, to, and he's wise, and he has managed to set aside a little grain to sow for next season's crop. Doing so means that his family is going to go a little bit hungry now. But it has to be done, although it's, it's still a risk. The, the risk is what if the rains don't come? Uh, what, what if it all dries up and nothing grows? And, and, and what if, because of that, his family starves and dies? Will he say, we should have just eaten the grain when we had it? So it is with tears, that is with fear and trepidation, that he sows that saved seed into the field. And then, what does he do? What can he do? He can do nothing but... Have patience. <laughs> he can do nothing but wait. He can do nothing but sit and wait and wait and wait, anticipating the rain over which he has absolutely no control, anticipating a future. At the beginning of the psalm, he remembers the time when the Lord's provision was beyond anything that he could have dreamed. Now, once again, he is in the spot where all he can do is dream of the Lord's provision. He has once again come to the place where he has to exercise faith, where he has to trust the Lord to provide. So he dreams of future joys. He dreams of answers to his prayers, answers beyond what he could possibly imagine, times of fresh outpouring, he, and, and when all the tears that have been sown will be rewarded with sheaves filled with this new grain. Isn't that the story of our lives? Past joys give us the courage to once again take new and necessary risks. To trust the Lord again for a, a new day of joy. Give us this day our daily joy. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. And, and, and the point of the psalm seems to be this. And by the way, there, there's no place to jot down the message guide. on the, There's no little fill-ins on the message guide for this. But this is the key point here. Those who call on the Lord in spite of difficult circumstances and limited resources can expect surprising moments of joy. Uh, I'll say it again. Those who call on the Lord in spite of difficult circumstances and limited resources can expect surprising moments of joy. You see, while there is longing 
an anticipation, perhaps this tinge of anxiety. There's also confidence that those who go out carrying and are crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. And I wonder if God isn't calling on you, if He is not calling on us to sow some new seeds, to dream afresh, to dream new, to trust God for the new thing that He is about to do in your life, in the life of your family. To step out and put more on the line, more of our resources, but more so more of ourselves. Yes, in the past, God has provided, often in ways that exceed our wildest dreams. Just so we know who's behind it all. But for some reason, doing it all over again, uh, trusting Him again, is still scary. Why is that? It's a mystery to me why that would be, because it seems so counterintuitive. Past experiences should give us extraordinary, extraordinary, additional, more confidence to trust God for the present and the future. But it seems that no matter how many dreams and how many miracles we've seen in the past, it is so easy to get caught up in the angst, in the anxiety, in the trouble of the moment, of the present. So we need to take a new step. We need to open ourselves up to new people and new opportunities. Such can evoke tears. <laughs> new makes us oh, crying. <laughs> Risk is painfully scary, tearfully scary at times, but absolutely necessary, at least if we are going to experience new joy. I'll tell you something. The um, IRS probably will not call to correct a major mistake. <laughs> that would be a Category 5 major miracle requiring <laughs> God to completely reorder the universe. <laughs> and, and he put the universe in a way that he did for a purpose. And, and also, Ed McMahon, Ed McMahon in case you didn't know, he died in 2009. So, he's probably not going to show up on your front porch either with this great big check. Um, and, and that lottery ticket that you found on the ground probably isn't a winner. Someone turned it into litter for that very reason. The dream won't really work itself out that way because that's too predictable. No, the Lord will restore our fortunes and fill us with new joy, but He's going to do it in a way that we, that you, have not yet begun to imagine. Yeah. Amen. Right? It, it, it's, it's a dream that's going to exceed expectations. It's going to be totally out of the box. Exceeding expectations in surprising new ways. So be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged. I, I want you to be ready to step out again and, and to be ready to sing with the psalmist. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are overjoyed. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, we seek joy. To be overjoyed at the great but invisible to us things which you are doing. Help us to think big and to expect surprises. Help us to see Jesus, the most surprising and unimaginable answer to our dreams. Help us to trust it all to you. Because of Jesus, we feel free to look to you and to trust you. Amen.